Hello. Today's topic is rhinitis and rhinosinusitis. It is actually a very important topic as far as your examination is concerned. Sinusitis case is commonly kept as short case during your clinical examinations also. Okay. So in this topic, we will be discussing the entire gamut of inflammatory lesions involving nose and paranasal sinuses. I have deliberately omitted one important uh, entity, disease entity, unique entity, which is known as atrophic rhinitis, which deserves a separate discussion on its own. So let us start. So first thing you should understand is the mucosal lining of nose and paranasal sinuses, which is namely the ciliated columnar epithelium, is a continuous lining, lining the entire nasal cavity as well as the paranasal sinuses. So the diagnosis of rhinosinusitis is purely a clinical one, based on the presence of certain characteristic and objective evidence, characteristic symptoms and objective evidence, which point towards mucosal inflammation. So, if the duration of illness is less than three weeks, then you consider it as acute rhinosinusitis. If it is more than three weeks duration, it is known as chronic rhinosinusitis. This definition per se is from the approach paper or the position paper of the European uh, Rhinosinusitis Society. Clinically, Rhinosinusitis definition has to follow certain criteria. So these are the definitive diagnostic criteria which needs to be fulfilled for branding a patient to be suffering from rhinosinusitis. So diagnostic criteria includes the symptoms should be correlated either by endoscopic or radiological findings. So before you come to the conclusion of rhinosinusitis, all the symptoms which the patient is manifesting with should be confirmed or correlated by endoscopic and radiological finding. So, we will have to classify these symptoms as major and minor or primary symptoms and additional symptoms. Primary symptoms is very important to make us come to a conclusion that probably this patient is suffering from rhinosinusitis pending correlation of diagnostic endoscopy and radiology. So, the primary symptoms include nasal blockage, obstruction, congested nasal mucosa as well as nasal discharge. The discharge can be anti-nasal discharge or posterior nasal discharge. So, among these primary symptoms, at least one should be present. I repeat again, among these so-called primary symptoms, at least one should be present to brand a patient to be suffering from rhinosinusitis. So, additional symptoms or the minor symptoms which uh, can point in the presence of primary symptoms, additional symptoms can add to the uh, weightage that is the facial pain, pressure on the olfactory dysfunction, pressure on the sinus area, olfactory dysfunction, hyposia and anosmia. So let me repeat again the additional symptoms, the presence of facial pain is one additional symptom, presence of pressure over the sinus area that is another symptom, then olfactory dysfunction like hyposmia and anosmia, again these are all the additional minor symptoms. So at least one of these minor symptoms should be needed in addition to the one of the primary symptoms to enable a clinician to come to a diagnosis of rhinosinusitis. And if any of these primary symptom, one primary and one additional symptom is present, you need to confirm it with a diagnostic endoscopy or CT scan. What exactly you see is a diagnostic endoscopy. You can see nasal polyposis, you can see mucopurulent discharge arising from the middle meatus, you can see edematous middle, middle uh, meatal mucosa, there is obstruction to the middle meatus. This can be confirmed, this can be confirmed by diagnostic nasal endoscopy. CT scan again, both coronal and axial CT scan, plain CT of the nose and paranasal sinuses will clearly show edema, mucosal edema, thickening, nausea mineral complex block. All these things can be clearly seen in CT scan. Now, these are all the 
additional symptoms of acute rhinocytosis which is a mention at least three of these following should be present to brand a patient to be suffering from acute rhinocytosis one is discolored nasal discharge severe pain with predominance to one side fever presence of fever and laboratory investigation namely elevated esr and elevated c reactive protein levels and there is another concept of double sickening what do you mean by double sickening there is deterioration of the general condition of the patient after initial recovery double sickening means there is a decrease deterioration of the initial condition of the patient after it improves again the patient has to deteriorate so this is actually the additional symptoms which help us to come to conclusion that the patient is suffering from acute rhinocytosis in addition to the duration of illness duration of illness classically should be under 3 weeks of duration so for all acute infections the duration of ailment should be under 3 weeks and in addition to that duration at least three of these above said factors should be positive or present in patients for you to classify them as acute rhinocytosis rhinocytosis namely colored or discolored nasal discharge severe pain with predominance to one side presence of fever and laboratory investigations which point towards the elevated esr and elevated c reactive protein levels and let me give you a small tip acute rhinocytosis rhinocytosis is considered to be bacterial if at least three of the above symptoms are present so you can consider a diagnosis of acute rhinocytosis or caused by bacterial infection if three of these symptoms are coexisting let me come to acute rhinocytosis now you should know the importance of the timeline timeline tells us timeline of the illness tells us gives us a great deal information about the probable etiological feature of rhinocytosis any acute viral rhinocytosis will last less than 10 days duration so for diagnosis of recurrent acute rhinocytosis the clearly the patient should have a symptom free episodes between these clinical events let us come to chronic rhinocytosis i as i've been already telling you about the importance of timeline rhinocytosis which lasts for more than 3 weeks duration is classified or it comes under chronic rhinocytosis so let us classify the rhinocytosis chronic rhinocytosis so basically you can divide the chronic rhinocytosis with the presence or absence of nasal polyposis so chronic rhinocytosis with nasal polyposis this is crs w and p with nasal polyposis and then chronic rhinocytosis without nasal polyposis its acronym is crs sans s is not it, it indicates sans and then sans nasal polyposis so without nasal polyposis rhinocytosis is chronic rhinocytosis is present so now let us see the uh, entity chronic rhinocytosis rhinocytosis with the nasal polyposis the chronic rhinocytosis with nasal polyposis can be sub classified into two further categories one is the presence of tissue eosinophilia or absence of tissue eosinophilia so namely it goes like this eosinophilic chronic rhinocytosis with nasal polyposis and then non eosinophilic chronic rhinocytosis with nasal polyposis let us just fathom the immunological aspects of these conditions so inflammation of type p helper cell type 2 or ph2 cell is actually the main dominant cell which causes tissue eosinophilia and the high prevalence of coexisting asthma so you should remember very well that inflammation in these patients are due to p helper type 2 cells p helper type 2 cells or ph2 cell this is actually the cell which is causing tissue eosinophilia as well as the coexisting bronchial asthma 
So chronic rhinosinusitis sans nasal polyposis, without nasal polyposis. This is actually thought to thought to result from recurrent episodes of acute rhinosinusitis. So whenever you are confronted with a patient with chronic rhinosinusitis without the, the nasal polyposis, you should always go ahead and ask the patient whether there is history of recurrent episodes of acute rhinosinusitis. This recurrent episodes of acute rhinosinusitis will cause occlusion of the sinus or ostium. So this occlusion contributes to filling up of the sinus uh, cavity and they contribute to the development of hypoxia within the sinus cavity. So what happens is in these patients, mind you, the inflammatory process is mediated by TH1 subset. Whereas in chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis, the uh, offending inflammatory mediator was TH2 subset. Here in chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyposis, T cell of H1 subset is responsible uh, for the inflammatory process in these patients. Now let us come to another unique uh, cause of rhinosinusitis, that is namely fungal rhinosinusitis. Currently, lots of attention is being paid to this unique entity. So, fungal infection of the nose and paranasal sinuses are really common. And mind you, currently we have an increasing incidence of HIV, diabetes, and these lesions, this uh, unique disease process has a say in the immune mechanism of the body. They depress the immune mechanism of the body, making the body more susceptible to fungal infections. But mind you, in India currently, the incidence of fungal sinusitis is getting common and even in immunocompetent, immunocompetent patients. So, the common fungi involved in nose and paranasal sinuses include Aspergillus niger and Aspergillus fumigatus, and these fungal elements are seen as black in color and Candida albicans is curdy white. Candida albicans appear as curdy white. So, if you, if you see the blackish uh, masses within the nasal cavity, it goes without saying the offending fungal organism belongs to the Aspergillus group and if it is white in color, appears more or less like thicker, it is Candida albicans. Let us go to the subclassification of fungal rhinosinusitis. So, these are the fungal rhinosinusitis can be subclassified into six different types of fungal sinusitis. The first is acute fulminant invasive sinusitis. Second is chronic invasive fungal sinusitis. Third is granulomatous invasive fungal sinusitis. Fourth is the fungal ball. Five is allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. Six is eosinophilic fungal sinusitis. Now let us see one by one and their features. Now acute fulminant invasive sinusitis. This is actually the uniqueness of this entity or subclassification is the entire duration of the illness is just less than a month. I repeat again, in acute fulminant invasive sinusitis, that you should always look into the term acute. Since it's acute, the entire duration of the illness is less than a month. And these patients are mostly immunocompromised, maybe due to HIV or maybe, to, maybe due to morbid uh, diabetes mellitus. And then fungus implicated in this uh, patients belong to mucos, uh, mucoraceae that is actually candida as well as aspergillus. So both these fungal, fungal families can infect these patients and mind you the mortality rate is pretty high in these patients because it is always coupled with immunocompromised status. Here these patients need surgical debridement of the area, removal of the fungus surgically and very difficult to manage these patients because the immunity is rather poor. So they have even gone to the extent of trying out granulocyte infusions to boost up the bolster the patient's immunity. So granulocyte infusions have been attempted to bolster the patient's immunity. So granulocyte infusions have been tried to be uh, to manage these patients after surgical debridement. Mind you, surgical debridement is the first one which is needed, and next comes the granulocyte infusion if the patient is still not recovering. Now, what are all the predisposing factors? which lead to this cause of acute fulminant rhino, fungal rhinosinusitis. These patients are mostly diabetics, they are HIV, could be AIDS patients, they could be on immunosuppressive medicines and they could also have a malignant lesion which is known to suppress the immune reaction. Let us go to the next one of the subclassification of fungal rhinosinusitis that is chronic invasive fungal sinusitis. So, uh, here 
This chronic invasive fungal sinusitis is also known as non granular matrix chronic invasive fungal sinusitis. So, this uh, term, the subclass of non granular matrix chronic invasive uh, fungal sinusitis, also indicates the absence of granular matrix reaction in this patient. So, these patients would have granular matrix reaction in response to the fungus. And commonly, the patients affected by this chronic invasive fungal sinusitis are diabetics. And these patients have low grade inflammation associated with tissue necrosis. So, they have low grade inflammation and tissue necrosis. And there is very little vascular invasion on these lesions. And the duration, since it is chronic, it is more than 4 weeks in nature. And classically, these patients have orbital involvement. The fungus involves the orbit. Orbital extension is also common because it erodes the medial wall of the orbit, which happens to be the lamina papricea, which is closely related to the lateral nasal wall. So, it erodes the medial wall of the orbit, extends to the orbit, leading on to proptosis and then on examination if you examine the debrated elements from the nasal cavity you can see granulomas fungal elements and let me assure you surgical debridement is in fact curative in nature now the third one is granulomatous invasive fungal sinusitis the previous one is non granulomatous and this one is granulomatous fungal sinusitis is also known as indolent fungal sinusitis because it is there smoldering and these patients have in fact cell mutated, mediated immune reaction. Their immunity is very good and these patients have intact cell mutated immunity and mind you clinically these patients are indistinguishable from non granulomatous fungal sinusitis but the presence of granuloma can be seen only in histopathology even though the granulomas are absent, it is difficult clinically to notice the absence of granulomatous lesion. So, you need a histopathological examination of the debrided tissue to identify clearly this subcategory of granulomatous invasive fungal sinusitis. Mind you, these patients have intact cell mediated immune system. The fourth one happens to be the fungal ball. So, this fungal ball. These are nothing but mycetomas present inside a cavity, sinus cavity, nasal cavity, spina sinus cavity. These are, these patients are usually immunocompetent and they don't have any allergic history or history of atopy, but fungal ball is seen. This fungal ball is nothing but a tightly packed hyphae, tightly ball like structure which has tightly packed hyphae. Often these are all formed by aspergillus fumigators. Treatment is actually, since it is just the ball seen within the cavity, removal of the fungal ball. Antifungal drugs need not be given to these patients. Let us see this video where you can see removal of fungal ball. So, endoscopy is passed, yes, endoscopy is used to pass. You see clearly a ball like structure within the nasal cavity. It is in the middle meatus. Obviously, it should have come out from the maxillary sinus. So, you, you can easily remove the fungal ball by using a suction apparatus or a spoon. See, it is being removed here in this case using suction apparatus. You see, it is black in color. So, black in color means aspergillus fumigators. See, you slowly remove entire fungal ball is coming in total. Now let us come to the most dangerous of all these fungal rhinosinusitis. It is allergic fungal rhinosinusitis or it is also known as AFRS. 
it is not that commonly a shark notes in your uh, theory exam they are just they are just ask to write short notes on afrs afrs means allergic from the right sinusitis these patients they have a combination of nasal polyposis they have, they may have nasal polyposis they have crust formation and then they have positive culture when you attempt to culture the tissue from the nasal cavity you will get positive culture for aspergillus and mind you these patients also have allergic reaction to aspergillus protein so these patients also have allergic reaction to aspergillus protein so these patients clinically they present to with progressive nasal obstruction crusty nasal discharge and chronic symptoms and features of chronic rhinosinusitis and mind you visual loss is seen in this patient because this allergic uh, fungal rhinosinusitis is caused by candid group of organism which is known to involve the orbit aggressively so mechanism of causation of afrs actually ige mediated hypersensitivity to fungal protein and that to aspergillus so what happens is the allergic reaction to ige ige mediated allergic reaction leads on to this allergic fungal rhinosinusitis they are, they cause massive destruction of medial wall of the orbit that is lamina papricia proptosis there is also vascular involvement of the orbit causes blindness visual loss is also common in these patients so bent has come out with unique criteria five point criteria to diagnose allergic fungal sinusitis these patients should demonstrate type 1 hypersensitivity to fungi they should demonstrate type 1 ige mediated hypersensitive reaction to fungi and these patients should have nasal polyposis radiologically they should have a heterodense mass lesion radiologically there should be heterodense mass lesions then presence of yeast nephric mucin mixed with fungus fungus so in the yeast nephric mucin should be identified and then it can be mixed with fungus which is non invasive in nature if you do a fungal staining it will be positive if you do a fungal culture it will be positive for aspergillus sometimes it can be positive even for candida so even though this afrs is a bilateral condition there is actually a certain degree of asymmetry seen in the radiograph one side will be affected more than the other there will be bone erosion and extension of the disease to adjacent area that will be followed by bone erosion and there will be expansion and bone remodeling thinning of the sinus walls and there will be heterogeneous areas within the mass thereby it shows that the entire area is filled with allergic fungal mucin so this shows heterogeneous area this is due to accumulation of heavy metals like iron and manganese and calcium so this is actually a component of the fungal mucin so because of the presence of these uh, elements heavy metals this small uh, white is for the senior this is actually a classic feature heterogeneity is actually a classic feature of allergic fungal sinus sinusitis and mind you the sinus contents becomes dried up desiccation of sinus contents so it also causes dense increased density in the ct scan so here you see the expansion lesion here you see the heterogeneity there be increase in the density of the opacity so these are all the feature of image seen in the imaging ct imaging of patients with afrs or allergic fungal rhinosinusitis so what are the mri features magnetic resonance imaging features seen in afrs so what are the features the protein content inside the polyp as well as the nasal cavity involved is very high and water concentration is very low and the presence of allergic mucin the mucin mind you has heavy water content with surrounding edema sinus mucosa so this causes the mri to show unique characters if you do a mri in t1 weighted uh, imaging the sinus cavity will demonstrate varying signal intensities there will be enhancement of the periphery of the sinuses because of mucosal edema in t2 weighted images there will be hypotensity within the sinuses due to dehydrated dehydrated state of the mucin so in t2 imaging there will be hypotensity in t1 imaging there will be enhancement of the periphery of the involved sinus due to mucosal edema 
So mind you, enhancement of the periphery of the sinuses of the involved sinuses is actually due to mucosa edema, which is actually a characteristic pathognomonic feature of MRI studies in these patients. So Bell's criteria is one of the important uh, short nose and oral questions asked. Now, this EFRS or allergic rhinosinus studies can be staged under three divisions. Zero is actually normal, no edema, no allergic mucin. Stage one is mucosal edema without allergic mucin. There will be mucosal edema alone. This is the earliest phase, mucosal edema without allergic mucin. So in these patients, it is sufficient if you can do the nasal cavity with isotonic saline and edema will subside and the whatever fungus there can be washed out. So initially stage 1 in AFRS, if you are able to identify, you can treat these patients effectively with nasal douching with isotonic normal saline. Then polypoidal edema with or without allergic mucin. So polypoidal edema is there is polyp formation within the nasal cavity. Allergic mucin may be present or may not be present. Mind you, when you the allergic mucin will be uh, seen at thick viscid secretion when you attempt to uh, suck the secretion out, it will come out as a long thread with the suction tip. Very difficult to remove this allergic mucin because of its thickness and viscidity. So sinus polyposis inside. In stage 3, there is sinus polyposis, presence of fungal debris and allergic mucin. All these three components are present in stage 3 of AFRS. Now there is one more entity, this is a classification, reasonably fungal sinusitis. Here, this disorder is always bilateral. So mind you, if you are confronted with a bilateral fungal infection, you always think in terms of reasonably fungal sinusitis. Then fungal hyphae is commonly seen in nearly almost all the patients. And IG levels, when you measure serum IG is normal. And this uh, reasonably fungal sinusitis is always caused by abnormalities involving cell-mediated immune response to fungal protein. So, eosinophilic fungal sinusitis is caused by abnormal cell-mediated immune response to fungal protein. Now, what are actually the risk factors? for rhinosinusitis. One is the presence of allergic rhinitis, presence of the, the, your habit of swimming in the swimming pool. Why the swimming pool swimming causes uh, uh, allergic rhinosinusitis? All your swimming pool water is heavily chlorinated. Some of the individuals may be hypersensitive to chlorine. So the presence of chlorine in the swimming pool can irritate the nasal mucosa and can cause rhinosinusitis. And the nasal block per se can predispose to rhinosinusitis. Immune deficiency status can predispose to nasal infections causing rhinosinusitis. Presence of cleft palate can cause rhinosinusitis because of nasal regurgitation of fluids. And then cartilaginous syndrome can cause rhinosinusitis because the ciliary bead is not efficient in propelling the secretions and collections within the sinus cavity and also from the nasal cavity. The CJB will not be in a position to clear out the mucus secretion from the nasal and sinus cavity. So that is the reason why patients or children with cartagenous syndrome are more prone for rhinosinusitis. Young syndrome again, it is the defect is in the ciliary motility, rheumatoid cilia. So again, similar to cartagenous syndrome, young syndrome also due to the disability or the inability of the cilia to propel the mucin, these patients have a risk of developing acute or chronic rhinosinusitis. Then gastroesophageal reflex diseases where the presence of acid, regurgitated acid into the nasal cavity and sinuses can cause disruption of the mucociliary mechanism predisposing to rhinosinusitis. That is good to the pathogens. Pathogenically speaking, the cause of disease is actually caused by narrowing of the sinus osteum, severe apparatus dysfunction, and the viscidity of the secretion. If the secretion from the nasal cavity and sinus cavity are abnormally viscid, poor in its water content, it is very difficult to propel this into the nasal cavity into the nasal sinus. So it gets stayed in the uh, sinuses. 
predisposing to infection. So, what are the causes of obstruction to natural velocity of the sinuses? Mucosal swelling can cause transient loss of the drainage of the sinuses. So, this mucosal swelling can be due to viral infection, can be due to bacterial infection. The common area this mucosal swelling occurs is in the middle meters where almost all the anterior model sinuses have their drainage into. So, this is actually a cesspool where drainage of the all the anterior group of sinuses drains into this area. So, if this critical area of the mucosa gets swollen up, it will cause transient blockage in the middle meatus area causing sinusitis involving all the anterior group of sinuses. So, I have already told you the entire nasal cavity and the sinus cavity is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium with a single line. So, if one area is affected, it goes without saying the entire nose. If there is rhinitis, there will always be associated sinusitis also because it is a continuous mucus lining. So, if there is sinusitis, there will always be associated rhinitis. So, the mucosal swelling can be caused by upper respiratory infection, allergy, immune disorders, tobacco smoke, cartilaginous syndrome. So, the mucosal swelling can be caused due to any of these conditions. The excellent way to handle mucosal swelling is nasal dilution. So, when you douse the nasal cavity with isotonic saline, there is an effective reduction in the nasal mucosal edema. So, it will immediately open up. You can use saline wash. You can ask the patient to instill isotonic saline nasal drop. That will reduce the mucosal edema. You can prescribe antibiotics, you can prescribe anti-inflammatory to reduce the mucosal edema whereby the drainage again will restart and the patient will have benefit. So, the next comes mechanical obstruction which can cause rhinosinusitis. The mechanical obstruction can be in the form of final literature, can be in the form of deviated nasal septum which can block the drainage of the sinuses, presence of nasal polyp which can block the drainage system presence of foreign body which can long standing foreign body which can block the drainage of the nose and sinuses presence of tumors again can block the drainage system presence of enlarged bullet model it can block the nasal drainage system this is actually the mechanical obstruction which leads to chronic rhinosinusitis now let us go to the local insults which predispose to rhinosinusitis Facial trauma again can cause uh, mucosal edema and rhinosinusitis. Swimming and diving due to the presence of excessive chlorine content in the swimming pool can cause nasal irritation and rhinosinusitis. Then in diving, the abrupt pressure changes as you dive again will cause rhinosinusitis. Prolonged use of nasal decongestion can cause rhinitis medicamentosa because of the rebound effect. And then, when the patient undergoes surgery and the anesthetist intubates the patient using the nasal tube, nasal intubation can cause mucosal edema and rhinosinusitis. This is again some of the local insults to the nose and sinuses which can lead to rhinosinusitis. Now, nasal polyposis, whereas various theories have been attributed to account for the pathophysiology of nasal polypus, how and why exactly nasal polyp occurs. When you see lot of theories trying to account, trying to explain why this condition is caused, it goes without saying none of these theories are 100% true. So when you see a large number of theories being narrated to explain the origin of a condition, you will have to be very cautious and you will have to assume that none of these theories could be right. So, Bilrath theory, Bilrath said that nasal polypi are nothing but adenomas, adenomas and benign growth, these adenomas grow under the nasal mucosa, these adenomas are nothing but in uh, swelling of the gland, mucinous gland. So, uh, nasal mucosa gets pushed due to the growth of the adenoma, due to the growth from the nasal gland outwards. So, he felt that all these nasal poly are benign adenomas. But mind you, Hoffman, he said that these lesions could be soft fibromas. He did not concur with Bilroth. 
uh, finding that uh, saying that these are adenomas Hoffman said these could be soft fibromas but as I've been warning you previously both these theories are not accepted these days now next is glandular cyst theory so glandular cyst theory this theory says that cystic glands in the polypar tissue are seen so these cystic glands are filled with mucus filled cysts so presence of cystic glands filled with mucus uh, collection is seen in the nasal polypar tissue probably they attributed this to be due to edema of the submucosa the submucosa the uh, submucosa lining of the nasal mucosa gets edematous due to various disease in cells and they cause obstruction to the drainage of the mucus glands so they obstruct the drainage of the mucus glands present in the nasal mucosa so what happens is this cystic lesion expands outwards upwards and becomes a nasal polyp and mind you taylor who did an interesting study he revealed that these mucus glandular cysts in fact occur after the polyp has formed so this becomes the greatest joke of all time because tumor uh, taylor said that this mucus glandular cyst doesn't develop before the polyp in fact these mucus glandular cysts they develop only after the polyp has already formed so this again, this glandular cyst theory also goes out of the window. Now next comes mucosal exudate theory. Muc mucosal exudate theory of Hayek. So Hayek, Hayek uh, postulated that nasal polyp could be formed due to accumulation of uh, mucosal exudate deep into the mucosa. So this accumulation of the exudate causes mucosa to bulge. He, according to Hayek, he said, the accumulation of the exudate or fluid which collected under the in the submucosa it bulged leading to polyp formation so the nasal mucosa glands and tubo alveolar glands get displaced outwards and upwards now let's come to extend wood theory i'm sorry blockage theory of jenkins so jenkins he based on this blockage theory on the premise that Development of the nasal polyp almost always is preceded by mucosal inflammation. So the infl mucosal inflammation could be either due to allergy or due to infection. The polyp itself, according to Jenkins, is actually the accumulation of intracellular fluid damped up within the localized tissue. So he considered, Jenkins considered the polyp to be edematous, edematous mucosa, which is due to accumulation of intracellular fluid content within the localized tissue. But mind you, this blockage, when it covers a huge area, multiple polyp is known to occur. So, so far, so good. But the major question that needs to be answered is, why polyp prefers certain area of the nasal cavity? I have already told you, the entire nasal cavity is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium, which even lines the sinus cavity also. So, if this theory is true, you cannot account for the prevalence of polyp in certain areas of the nose when compared to the other areas. Why should it be prevalent only in certain areas? If the blockage it covers a large area, according to Jenkins, will cause multiple polyposis. So again, this theory has this gray area. Now, let us come to the periphlebitis, periangitis, perilymphangitis, periphlebitis and perilymphangitis theory of external wolf. The external theory, he says, Recurrent infection of the nasal mucosa blocks the intracellular transport mechanism. So within the mucosa, there is an intracellular fluid transport mechanism which maintains the local hemostatic environment. So what happens is recurrent infection, they block this process of intracellular transport. This is associated with edema of the lamina propria. There is always ed associated edema of lamina propria. There are chronic vascular changes in the mucosa Histologically, these changes are considered to be really diffuse. Again, the question comes to bite us is why polyp is localized in certain areas? If this is true, the entire polypartal reaction needs to be found right through the nasal cavity, which is not true. Now, let us go to the next theory, glandular hyperplasia theory of Rajinia. So, Rajinia said chronic inflammation of the nasal mucosa, they cause local hyperplasia of the nasal mucosal glands. Rajinia said chronic inflammation which could be due to infection or due to allergy can cause the nasal mucosa 
to hypertrophy, hyperplo uh, hyperplasia of the nasal mucosa gland. These hyperplastic glands causes bulging of the nasal mucosa. In addition to the glandular hyperplasia, there are changes noticed in the blood vessels also. This causes edema in the middle matter. So there is increasing nasal mucosa edema. Mind you, the number of nasal glands in the polycoidal tissue is actually found to be the same as in the normal tissue. This is actually the glandular hyperplasia of Crajinia. See, Crajinia said it is nothing but the mucous glands which get hypertrophied in relation to repeated infections and inflammation. And next, epithelial rupture theory. This is actually the currently accepted theory and which says that there is a epithelial rupture due to inflammation in tissue edema. Whenever there is inflammation in tissue edema, the epithelium has a tendency to rupture. When there is a rupture of epithelium, the lamina propria just prolapses through the defect in order to fill the defect. So first phase is there is rupture of the epithelium due to inflammation or tissue edema. Next what happens, the lamina propria fills at or attempt, makes an attempt to fill the defect by prolapsing into the defect. What happens, the adjacent epithelium attempts to cover up the lamina propria. When the lamina propria covers up this defect, adjacent epithelium grows over it, it covers the uh, lamina propria and ultimately this becomes a polyp. So this grows and grows and grows, this epithelialization occurs and prolapse continues and it goes into a polyp. So after the epithelialization of the polyp, characteristically long tubular glands are formed. The tubular glands become longer and longer as shown in the picture. So this is how currently the nasal polyp pathogenesis has been accounted for. Now let us go to a unique entity, antrogonal polyp. Antrogonal polyp is actually solitary polyp. And this polyp is dumbbell in shape. It has its origin in the maxillary sinus. It gets out of the maxillary sinus through a separate ostia. It doesn't come out of the natural ostia. It comes out through the accessory ostia, which is enlarged. It is huge. Size is huge when compared to the natural ostia. It comes out through the accessory ostia, occupies the posterior portion of the nasal cavity, and then slowly slides back to occupy the nasal pharynx. So, anthraconal polyp is a benign solitary polyp or a lesion. Starts starting from the maxillary sinus antrum. It causes opacification and enlargement of the antrum radiologically. There is no evidence of bone destruction. That is very important. That is, mm, there is no evidence of bone destruction in this patient. It exits the antrum as I have already stressed through the accessory ostium. And then this accessory ostium is found to be large. It reaches the nasal cavity and it expands posteriorly into the nasal pharynx. So it is a dumbbell shaped polyp. So one aspect, one bigger for one dumbbell is the one bell happens to be the maxillary sinus component, the other dumbbell happens to be the nasal and nasopharyngeal component. Now let us go to the etiology. So this is, this uh, anthraconal polyp is known to affect children and young adolescents. So this disease is commonly seen in non-allergic, non-atopic patients. Etiology is still known. Currently they feel in, uh, infection is supposed to be one of the common cause of anthraconal polyp. Again, I've been telling you various theories have been propounded to explain how this disease is caused. Whenever there is more than one theory, it goes without saying, without uh, doubt that none of these theories could be 100% right. So let us go to Proet's theory. Proet suggested that this disease could basically be due to faulty development of the maxillary sinus ostium. The maxillary sinus always drains the natural ostium. According to Proet, he said, the maxillary sinus has developed a new ostium and the hypertrophic mucosa of the maxillary sinus sprouts out through the enlarged abnormal uh, accessory ostium to get into the nasal cavity. So he attributed the entire pathology to the presence of axillary ostium. So the growth of the polyp according to him is due to the impediment of the venous return, venous return from the polyp. This imped impediment can occur at the level of the maxillary sinus ostium. So the venous stasis leads to edema thereby increasing the size of the polyp. Now that, this theory is not accepted because the accessory ostium per se, presence of accessory ostium per se, doesn't predispose to anthraconal polyp. So let us come to Bernoulli's phenomenon. Bernoulli's phenomenon, Bernoulli is actually a 
theory of physics which says that there is a pressure drop next to the constriction. So whenever there is a pressure drop next to a constriction, it causes a suction effect pulling the sinus mucosa into the nose. So Bernoulli, according to Bernoulli's theory, what happens is there is whenever there is air passes through a constriction, there will be a negative pressure at the level of the constriction. So this negative pressure which occurs at the level of the middle meatus, it pulls the sinus mucosa into the nose, causing prolapse of the mucosa, thereby leading to formation of entrepreneurial poly. Then mucopolysaccharide changes. Jackson, this is actually Jackson's theory of entrepreneurial poly. Jackson postulated the changes in the mucopolysaccharides underground substance can predispose predisposed to nasal polyps. This is again currently not accepted. Let us go to Mills theory. Now Mills postulated that anthraconal polyps could be maxillary mucosal. They are nothing but and which could be caused due to obstruction of mucinous glands. According to Mills, the anthraconal polyp is actually a maxillary mucosal caused by obstruction of the mucinous glands in the maxillary sinus. And this uh, gland mucosal prolapses through the axis aorta into the nasal cavity. Then Ewing's theory. Ewing suggested that cat there could have been a congenital anomaly which could occur during the maxillary sinus development. And this anomaly could leave behind a mucosal fold very close to the ostium. This mucosal fold, due to repeated air flow causing negative pressure at the level of the constriction or middle meters can get sucked into the nasal cavity due to the effect of inspired air. So according to Ewings, he said there is a, this is actually a, it's as a result of congenital anomaly which left behind a small mucosal fold inside the maxillary sinus close to the ostium. So what happens whenever the inspired air traverses that area, there is a relative negative pressure due to Bernoulli's effect and this fold gets pushed out into the nasal cavity through the axis ostium, leading on to formation of anthraconal poly. Now, vasomotor imbalance theory. So, this theory suggests the polyphoretic tissue could be a result of imbalance in the vasomotor system. Let us go to the clinical features of anthraconal poly. As I have already told you, anthraconal poly for unilateral in nature. We have unilateral nasal discharge, headache is usually unilateral, epistax is actually unilateral. These children may suffer from sleep apnea because a huge polyp can prolapse into the nasal pharynx causing obstruction to both the nasal cavity and they can manifest with rhinorrhea eclosa because the nasal polyp is sitting over the post nasal space over the soft palate and they can have difficulty in swallowing if it extends into the oropharynx. Let us go to imaging. CT of the nose and pharynx is This is actually a coronal cut. You see the polyparisy of the maxillary antrum. This is actually the axial ostium getting into the nasal cavity. Sorry. This video clipping shows surgery, endoscopic sinus surgery being performed to remove the anthraconal polyp. So you see the coronal component. This is actually the coronal component of the nasal polyp. Now let us go into the middle matrix and see. You see the polyp beautifully come. This is the middle terminate. This is the middle terminate. And the polyp is coming out of the middle meatus. You see the polyp coming out of the middle meatus. The polyp is beautifully coming out of the middle meatus. See. You are seeing the nasal pharyngeal component, you are seeing the nasal component. See? Ah, yes. It is coming out of the accessory ostium in the middle matrix. So the polyp is seen in the middle matrix. Now you see the obstructed sinus leads to purulent discharge. You see the purulent discharge extruding from the accessory ostium. The polyp also is coming out of the accessory ostium. A ball probe being used to probe and identify in the accessory ostium. Suction is used to suck out the turbulent secretions. Now, backbiting force is used to widen the ostium. 
Kim? Accessory Austin. The unseen it is removed to create more space and widen the natural Austin. So in this, in this case, both the natural and accessory Austin are converted into a single large Austin. So this will ensure that we are able to remove the entire polyp in total. So the trick of the trade is you should merge both the Austin, convert both the natural Austin, uh, natural and accessory Austin, make it the single large Austin. So you, you are made it into a single large Austin. So this is the single large Austin. So the polyp is being removed from uh, from the sinus, macular sinus, you see the sinus component coming out. See the next polyp being delivered out. The curved suction being introduced into the maxillary sinus. The small bit within the sinus will be removed next. Trick is you should remove the entire poly totally, leaving behind nothing. The more complete your remove is, the chances of recurrence is less. The most clinical cavity is packed up after removal. Now, commonly in your oral exam, your examiner will ask why the entrepreneurial polyp has a tendency to present posteriorly to the nasopharynx. Certain reasons are acceptable. The accessory ostium to which the polyp is getting out into the nasal cavity is present posteriorly. The nocturnal ostium is anterior, accessory ostium is posterior. So naturally the polyp presents posteriorly. The inspiratory air current, in fact, is more powerful when compared to the expiratory air current because inspiration is active process. So the inspiratory air current is powerful. So what happens? The power of the inspiratory air current pushes the polyp posteriorly. Then naturally, the third reason is naturally so the nasal cavity is actually oriented posteriorly. So the natural slope of the nasal cavity is oriented posteriorly. So the polyp always slips posteriorly into the nasal pharynx. The last but not the least, the sleeping cilia, the cilia of the uh, ciliated column of epithelium always leads towards the nasal pharynx, thereby pushing the polyp behind. So these are the four reasons why entrepreneurial polyp presents posteriorly. Now let us come to medical management. So in all the patients with acute rhinosinusitis, antibiotics is, is a must to clear out the bacterial infection. So you administer antiviral, uh, ideally amoxicillin group, amoxicillin group is ideal, you then administer amoxicillin or amoxicillin clavulanic acid combination for a period of a week. Antihistamines have been uh, prescribed, antihistamines are useful when uh, IgE is known to cause uh, polyboidal reactions. So invariably to treat uh, chronic rhinosinusitis and inflammatory medicines are also included. Silent douching helps a lot. The patient should be taught regularly to douche the nasal cavity using isotonic saline. Silent douching not only helps to reduce the mucosal edema, it also washes away the infecting material from the nasal cavity. Then, in the presence of nasal polyposis, trust me, systemic steroids allows a poly to shrink. The poly tissue simply melts when you put the patient on systemic steroids. Of course, the systemic steroids have got its own side effects. The patients may develop Cushing syndrome. So what to do is, you can prefer in such patients, ideal for you to prescribe topical steroids. Topical steroids comes in dose weaker nasal spray. So you can use um, Pisonia, uh, 
beauty tonight uh, into play so this uh, for every press of the button 100 microgram is delivered the nasal cavity you can ask the patient to use two pops to each nose twice a day for a period of nine months so here since the dosage of steroid used is very very less and it is directly delivered to the nasal mucosa the patient has got lasting relief plus there is no toxicity like cushion syndrome so topical steroids are preferred to the system let us come to surgical management so these patients so you see polyp polyp tissue present so this is already fungal or anastomosis so you need to remove these polyps so instead of pulling these polyps we will be using a drill like thing it's called a debrider it will suck and bite you see it's biting it's a powered instrument so you can something like a motor it will just bite and eat away the polyp see it's eating away the polyp you can see debrider in action it's called micro debrider polyp can be removed easily using a debrider it can do a complete job if you use conventional instrument the uh, removal is not adequate you see the fungal mask coming up this is actually the fungal mask you see the cursor this is the fungal mask curd is a curdy substance you see this is the fungal mask the polyp or tissue around the fungal mask is being sucked out debrided out that is cleaned out middle dominate This is a fungal mask being fungal mask being removed. Cheesy materials are being scooped out, pulled out. Got to be very patient while they remove this. You are not supposed to leave that. It is a fungal material inside. Do a complete job when you have the opportunity. See the fungal part being scooped out. Little bit tightly packed, believe me. You very tightly packed. So you need to pull it out bit by bit. the visibility is poor you can always wash the uh, nasal cavity with uh, saline to improve the visibility to reduce the secretion see the polypore tissue being slowly teased away This is the maxillary sinus. Polyp is being removed from from inside the maxillary sinus. So this is the maxillary sinus. My cursor is pointing towards maxillary sinus. The entire median wall of the maxillary sinus is totally removed. So the maxillary sinus artery is directly into the lateral nasal wall. You can see the maxillary sinus just from putting the endoscope.
thank you that is all for today